Chapter Five of La Barre by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Keen Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Come right in and get warm. Ah, messieurs, we must not do that any more," said Madame Carré, seeing Durtal draw from his pocket some bottles wrapped in paper, while Des Hermies placed on the table some little packages tied with twine. You mustn't spend your money on us. Oh, but you see, we enjoy doing it, Madame Carré. And your husband? He is in the tower. Since morning he has been going from one tantrum into another. My, the cold is terrible today, said Durtal, and I should think it would be no fun up there. Oh, he isn't grumbling for himself, but for his bells. Take off your things. They took off their overcoats and came up close to the stove. It isn't what you would call hot in here, said Madame Carré, but to thaw this place you would have to keep a fire going night and day. Why don't you get a portable stove? Oh, heavens, that would asphyxiate us. It wouldn't be very comfortable at any rate, said Des Hermies, for there's no chimney. You might get some joints of pipe and run them out the window, the way you have fixed this tubing. But speaking of that kind of apparatus, Durtal, doesn't it seem to you that those hideous galvanized iron contraptions perfectly typify our utilitarian epoch? Just think, the engineer, offended by any object that hasn't a sinister or ignoble form, reveals himself entire in this invention. He tells us, you want heat? You shall have heat, and nothing else. Anything agreeable to the eye is out of the question. No more snapping, crackling wood fire, no more gentle, pervasive warmth. The useful without the fantastic. Ah, the beautiful jets of flame darting out from a red cave of coals and spurting up over a roaring log but there are lots of stoves where you can see the fire objected madame yes and then it's worse yet fire behind a grated window of mica flame in prison depressing ah those fine fires of faggots and dry vine stocks out in the country they smell good and they cast a golden glow over everything modern life has set that in order the luxury of the poorest of peasants is impossible in paris except for people who have copious incomes the bell-ringer entered every hair of his bristling moustache was beaded with a globule of snow with his knitted bonnet his sheepskin coat his fur mittens and galoshes he resembled a samoyed fresh from the pole i won't shake hands he said for i am covered with grease and oil what weather just think i've been scouring the bells ever since early this morning i'm worried about them why why you know very well that frost contracts the metal and sometimes cracks or breaks it some of these bitterly cold winters we have lost a good many because bells suffer worse than we do in bad weather wife is there any hot water in the other room so i can wash up can't we help you set the table de hermie proposed but the good woman refused no no sit down dinner is ready mighty appetizing said durtal inhaling the odor of a peppery pot au feu perfumed with a symphony of vegetables of which the keynote was celery everybody sit down said carré reappearing with a clean blouse on his face shining of soap and water they sat down the glowing stove purred durtal felt the sudden relaxation of a chilly soul dipped into a warm bath at carré's one was so far from paris so remote from the epoch the lodge was poor but cosy comfortable cordial the very table set country style the polished glasses the covered dish of sweet butter the cider pitcher the somewhat battered lamp casting reflections of tarnished silver on the great cloth contributed to the atmosphere of home next time i come i must stop at the english store and buy a jar of that reliable orange marmalade said durtal to himself for by common consent with des hermies he never dined with the bell-ringer without furnishing a share of the provisions carré set out a pot au feu and a simple salad and poured his cider not to be an expense to him des hermies and durtal brought wine coffee liquor desserts and managed so that their contributions would pay for the soup and the beef which would have lasted for several days if the carrés had eaten alone this time i did it said madame carré triumphantly serving to each in turn a mahogany-coloured bouillon whose iridescent surface was looped with rings of topaz it was succulent and unctuous robust and yet delicate flavoured as it was with the broth of a whole flock of boiled chickens 
the diners were silent now their noses in their plates their faces brightened by steam from the savoury soup soup two selected dishes a salad and a dessert now is the time to repeat the chestnut dear to flaubert you can't dine like this in a restaurant said durtal let's not malign the restaurant said des hermies they afford a very special delight to the person who has the instinct of the inspector i had an opportunity to gratify this instinct just the other night i was returning from a call on a patient and i dropped into one of these establishments where for the sum of three francs you are entitled to soup two selected dishes a salad and a dessert the restaurant where i go as often as once a month has an unvarying clientele hostile highbrows officers in mufti members of parliament bureaucrats while laboriously gnawing my way through a redoubtable soul with sauce au gratin i examined the habitués seated all around me and i found them singularly altered since my last visit they had become bony or bloated their eyes were either hollow with violet rings around them or puffy with crimson pouches beneath the fat people had become yellow and the thin ones were turning green more deadly than the forgotten benefices of the days of the avignon papacy the terrible preparation served in this place was slowly poisoning its customers i was interested as you may believe i made myself the subject of a course of toxicological research and studying my food as it went down i identified the frightful ingredients masking the mixtures of tannin and powdered carbon with which the fish was embalmed and i penetrated the disguise of the marinated meats painted with sauces the colour of sewage and i diagnosed the wine as being coloured with fusion perfumed with furfurol and enforced with molasses and plaster i have promised myself to return every month to register the slow but sure progress of these people toward the tomb oh cried madame carre and you will claim said durtal that you aren't satanic see si, carre he's at it already he won't even give us time to get our breath but must be dogging us about satanism it's true i promised him i'd try and get you to tell us something about it tonight yes continued des hermies in response to carre's look of astonishment yesterday durtal who is engaged as you know in writing a history of gilles de Ray, declared that he possessed all the information there was about diabolism in the middle ages i asked him if he had any material on the satanism of the present day he asked me what i was talking about and wouldn't believe that these practices are being carried on right now but they are replied carre becoming grave it is only too true before we go any further there is one question i'd like to put to des hermies said durtal can you honestly without joking without letting that saturnine smile play around the corner of your mouth tell me in perfectly good faith whether you do or do not believe in catholicism hey exclaimed the bell-ringer why he's worse than an unbeliever he's a heresiarch the fact is if i was certain of anything i would be inclined toward manichaeism said des hermies it's one of the oldest and it is the simplest of religions and it best explains the abominable mess everything is in at the present time the principle of good and the principle of evil the god of light and the god of darkness two rivals are fighting for our souls that's at least clear right now it is evident that the evil god has the upper hand and is reigning over the world as master now and on this point carre who is distressed by these theories can't reprehend me i am for the underdog that's a generous and perfectly proper idea but manichaeism is impossible cried the bell-ringer two infinities cannot exist together but nothing can exist if you get to reasoning the moment you argue the catholic dogma everything goes to pieces the proof that two infinities can coexist is that this idea passes beyond reason and enters the category of those things referred to in ecclesiasticus inquire not into things higher than thou for many things have shown themselves to be above the sense of men manichaeism you see must have had some good in it because it was bathed in blood at the end of the twelfth century thousands of albigenses were roasting for practising this doctrine of course i can't say that the manichaeans didn't abuse their cult mostly made up of devil worship because we know very well they did on this point i am not with them he went on slowly after a silence he was waiting till madame carre who had got up to remove the plates should go out of the room to fetch the beef 
while we are alone he said seeing her disappear through the stairway door i can tell you what they did an excellent man named sellers has revealed to us in a book entitled de operatione demonum the fact that they tasted of the two excrements at the beginning of their ceremonial and that they mixed human semen with the host horrible exclaimed carre oh as they took both kinds of communion they did better than that returned des Hermies. they cut children's throats and mixed the blood with ashes and this paste dissolved in liquid constituted the eucharistic wine you bring us right back to satanism said durtal why yes as you see i haven't strayed off your subject i am sure monsieur des Hermies has been saying something awful murmured madame carre as she came in bearing a platter on which was a piece of beef smothered in vegetables oh madame protested des Hermies. they burst out laughing and carre cut up the meat while his wife poured the cider and durtal uncorked the bottle of anchovies i am afraid it's cooked too much said the woman who was a great deal more interested in the beef than in other world adventures and she added the famous maxim of housekeepers when the broth is good the beef won't cut the men protested that it wasn't stringy a bit it was cooked just right have an anchovy and a little butter with your meat monsieur durtal wife let's have some of the red cabbage that you preserved said carre whose pale face was lighted up while his great canine eyes were becoming suspiciously moist visibly he was jubilant he was at table with friends in his tower safe from the cold but empty your glasses you're not drinking he said holding up the cider pot let's see des Hermies, you were claiming yesterday that satanism has pursued an uninterrupted course since the middle ages said durtal wishing to get back to the subject which haunted him yes and the documents are irrefutable i'll put you into a position to prove them whenever you wish at the end of the fifteenth century that is to say at the time of gilles de Ray, to go no further back satanism had assumed the proportions that you know in the sixteenth it was worse yet no need to remind you i think of the demoniac pactions of catherine de medici and of the valois of the trial of the monk jean de vaux of the investigations of the sprengers and the langres and those learned inquisitors who had thousands of necromancers and sorcerers roasted alive all that is known too well known one case is not too well known for me to cite here that of the priest benedictus who cohabited with the she-devil armelina and consecrated the hosts holding them upside down here are the diabolical threads which bind that century to this in the seventeenth century in which the sorcery trials continue and in which the possessed of loudin appeared the black religion nourishes but already it has been driven under cover i will cite you an example one among many if you like a certain abbe guibourg made a specialty of these abominations on a table serving as tabernacle a woman lay down naked or with her skirts lifted up over her head and with her arms outstretched she held the altar lights during the whole office Guibourg thus celebrated masses on the abdomen of madame de montespan of madame d'argenson of madame de saint pont as a matter of fact these masses were very frequent under the grand monarch numbers of women went to them as in our times women flock to have their fortunes told with cards the ritual of these ceremonies was sufficiently atrocious generally a child was kidnapped and burnt in a furnace out in the country somewhere the ashes were saved and mixed with the blood of another child whose throat had been cut and of this mixture a paste was made resembling that of the manichaeans of which i was speaking abbe guibourg officiated consecrated the host cut it into little pieces and mixed it with this mixture of blood and ashes that was the material of the sacrament what a horrible priest cried madame carre indignant yes he celebrated another kind of mass too that abbe did it was called hang it it's unpleasant to say say it monsieur des Hermies. when people have as great a hatred for that sort of thing as we here they need not blink any fact it isn't that kind of thing which is going to take me away from my prayers nor me added her husband well this sacrifice was called the spermatic mass oh Yiburg, wearing the alb the stole and the maniple celebrated this mass with the sole object of making pastes to conjure with the archives of the bastille inform us that he acted thus at the request of a lady named des Oeillettes. this woman who was indisposed gave some of her blood the man who accompanied her stood patiently beside the bed where the scene took place 
and Gibor gathered up some of his semen into the chalice then added powdered blood and some flour and after sacrilegious ceremonies the desoyet woman departed bearing her paste my heavenly saviour sighed the bell-ringer's wife what a lot of filth but said durtal in the middle ages the mass was celebrated in a different fashion the altar then was the naked buttocks of a woman in the seventeenth century it was the abdomen and now nowadays a woman is hardly ever used for an altar but let us not anticipate in the eighteenth century we shall again find abbés among how many other monsters who defile holy objects one canon duet occupied himself specially with black magic and the evocation of the devil he was finally executed as a sorcerer in the year of grace seventeen eighteen there was another who believed in the incarnation of the holy ghost as the paraclete and who in lombary which he stirred up to a feverish pitch of excitement ordained twelve apostles and twelve apostolines to preach his gospel this man abbe beccarelli like all the other priests of his ilk abused both sexes and he said mass without confessing himself of his lecheries as his cult grew he began to celebrate travestied offices in which he distributed to his congregation aphrodisiac pills presenting this peculiarity that after having swallowed them the men believed themselves changed into women and the women into men the recipe for these hippomanes is lost continued des hermies with almost a sad smile to make a long story short beccarelli met with a very miserable end he was prosecuted for sacrilege and sentenced in seventeen o eight to row in the galleys for seven years these frightful stories seem to have taken away your appetite said madame carre come monsieur des hermies a little more salad no thanks but now we've come to the cheese i think it's time to open the wine and he uncapped one of the bottles which durtal had brought it's a light chinon wine but not too weak i discovered it in a little shop down by the quay said durtal i see he went on after a silence that the tradition of unspeakable crimes has been maintained by worthy successors of gilles de Ray. i see that in all centuries there have been fallen priests who have dared commit sins against the holy ghost but at the present time it all seems incredible surely nobody is cutting children's throats as in the days of bluebeard and of abbe Guibourg. you mean that nobody is brought to justice for doing it they don't assassinate now but they kill designated victims by methods unknown to official science ah if the confessionals could speak cried the bell-ringer but tell me what class of people are these modern covenanters with the devil prelates abbesses mission superiors confessors of communities and in rome the centre of present-day magic they're the very highest dignitaries answered des hermies as for the laymen they are recruited from the wealthy class that explains why these scandals are hushed up if the police chance to discover them then let us assume that the sacrifices to the devil are not preceded by preliminary murders perhaps in some cases they aren't the worshippers probably content themselves with bleeding a fetus which had been aborted as soon as it became matured to the point necessary bloodletting is supererogatory anyway and serves merely to whet the appetite the main business is to consecrate the host and put it to an infamous use the rest of the procedure varies there is at present no regular ritual for the black mass well then is a priest absolutely essential to the celebration of these offices certainly only a priest can operate the mystery of transubstantiation i know there are certain occultists who claim to have been consecrated by the lord as saint paul was and who think they can consummate a veritable sacrifice just like a real priest absurd but even in default of real masses with ordained celebrants the people possessed by the mania of sacrilege do none the less realize the sacred stupration of which they dream listen to this in eighteen fifty five there existed at paris an association composed of women for the most part these women took communion several times a day and retained the sacred wafer in their mouths to be spat out later and trodden underfoot or soiled by disgusting contacts you are sure of it perfectly these facts were revealed by a religious journal les annales de la sainteté and the archbishop of paris could not deny them i add that in eighteen seventy four women were likewise enrolled at paris to practice this odious commerce they were paid so much for every wafer they brought in that explains why they presented themselves at the sacred table of different churches every day and that is not the half of it look said carre in his turn rising and taking from his bookshelf a blue brochurette 
here is a review la voix de la Cetaine, dated 1843 it informs us that for twenty-five years at Agen, a satanistic association regularly celebrated black masses and committed murder and polluted three thousand three hundred and twenty hosts and monsignor the bishop of Agen, who was a good and ardent prelate never dared deny the monstrosities committed in his diocese yes we can say it among ourselves de hermie returned in the nineteenth century the number of foul-minded abbés has been legion unhappily though the documents are certain they are difficult to verify for no ecclesiastic boasts of such misdeeds the celebrants of the deicidal masses dissemble and declare themselves devoted to christ they even affirm that they defend him by exorcising the possessed that's a good one the possessed are made so or kept so by the priests themselves who are thus assured of subjects and accomplices especially in the convents all kinds of murderous and sadistic follies can be covered with the antique and pious mantle of exorcism let us be just said carré the satanist would not be complete if he were not an abominable hypocrite hypocrisy and pride are perhaps the most characteristic vices of the perverse priest suggested durtal but in the long run de hermie went on in spite of the most adroit precautions everything comes out up to now i have spoken only of local satanistic associations but there are others more extensive which ravage the old world and the new for diabolism is quite up to date in one respect it is highly centralized and very capably administered there are committees subcommittees a sort of curia which rules america and europe like the curia of a pope the biggest of these societies founded as long ago as eighteen fifty five is the society of the re theurgiste optimate beneath an apparent unity it is divided into two camps one aspiring to destroy the universe and reign over the ruins the other thinking simply of imposing upon the world a demoniac cult of which it shall be high priest this society has its seat in america it was formerly directed by one longfellow an adventurer born in scotland who entitled himself grand priest of the new evocative magism for a long time it has had branches in france italy germany russia austria even turkey it is at the present moment moribund or perhaps quite dead but another has just been created the object of this one is to elect an anti-pope who will be the exterminating antichrist and those are only two of them how many others are there more or less important numerically more or less secret which by common accord at ten o'clock the morning of the feast of the holy sacrament celebrate black masses at paris rome bruges constantinople nantes lyon and in scotland where sorcerers swarm then outside of these universal associations and local assemblies isolated cases abound on which little light can be shed and that with great difficulty some years ago there died in a state of penitence a certain comte de lautre who presented several churches with statues which he had bewitched so as to satanize the faithful at bruges a priest of my acquaintance contaminates the holy ciboria and uses them to prepare spells and conjurements finally one may among all these cite a clear case of possession it is the case of cantianil who in eighteen sixty five turned not only the city of auxerre but the whole diocese of sens upside down this cantianil placed in a convent of mont saint sulpice was violated when she was barely fifteen years old by a priest who dedicated her to the devil this priest himself had been corrupted in early childhood by an ecclesiastic belonging to a sect of possessed which was created the very day louis the sixteenth was guillotined what happened in this convent where many nuns evidently mad with hysteria were associated in erotic devilry and sacrilegious rages with cantianil reads for all the world like the procedure in the trials of wizards of long ago the histories of gaufredi and madeleine palu of urbain grandier and madeleine bavin or the jesuit girard and la cadiere histories by the way in which much might be said about hysteroepilepsy on one hand and about diabolism on the other at any rate contianil after being sent away from the convent was exorcised by a certain priest of the diocese abbe Torre, who seems to have been contaminated by his patient soon at auxerre there were such scandalous scenes such frenzied outbursts of diabolism that the bishop had to intervene cantianil was driven out of the country abbe torre was disciplined and the affair went to rome the curious thing about it is that the bishop terrified by what he had seen requested to be dismissed 
and retired to fontainebleau where he died still in terror two years later my friends said carré consulting his watch it is a quarter to eight i must be going up into the tower to sound the angelus don't wait for me have your coffee i shall rejoin you in ten minutes he put on his greenland costume lighted a lantern and opened the door a stream of glacial air poured in white molecules whirled in the blackness the wind is driving the snow in through the loopholes along the stair said the woman i am always afraid that louis will take cold in his chest this kind of weather oh well monsieur de hermie here is the coffee i appoint you to the task of serving it at this hour of day my poor old limbs won't hold me up any longer i must go lie down the fact is sighed de hermie when they had wished her good night the fact is that mamma carre is rapidly getting old i have vainly tried to brace her up with tonics they do no good she has worn herself out she has climbed too many stairs in her life poor woman all the same it's very curious what you have told me said durtal to sum up the most important thing about satanism is the black mass that and the witchcraft and incubacy and succubacy which i will tell you about or rather i will get another more expert than i in these matters to tell you about them sacrilegious mass spells and succubacy there you have the real quintessence of satanism and these hosts consecrated in blasphemous offices what use is made of them when they are not simply destroyed but i already told you they are used to consummate infamous acts listen and de hermy took from the bell ringer's bookshelf the fifth volume of the mystique of Goeres. here is the flower of them all these priests in their baseness often go so far as to celebrate the mass with great hosts which then they cut through the middle and afterwards glue to a parchment similarly cloven and use abominably to satisfy their passions holy sodomy in other words exactly at this moment the bell set in motion in the tower boomed out the chamber in which durtal and des hermies were sitting trembled and a droning filled the air it seemed that waves of sound came out of the walls unrolling in a spiral from the very rock and that one was transported in a dream into the inside of one of these shells which when held up to the ear simulate the roar of rolling billows des hermies accustomed to the mighty resonance of the bells at short range thought only of the coffee which he had put on the stove to keep hot then the booming of the bell came more slowly the humming departed from the air the window panes the glass of the bookcase the tumblers on the table ceased to rattle and gave off only a tenuous tinkling a step was heard on the stair carre entered covered with snow christy boys it blows he shook himself threw his heavy outer garments on a chair and extinguished his lantern there were blinding clouds of snow whirling in between the sounding shutters i can hardly see dog's weather the lady has gone to bed good but you haven't drunk your coffee he asked as he saw durtal filling the glasses carre went up to the stove and poked the fire then dried his eyes which the bitter cold had filled with tears and drank a great draught of coffee now that hits the spot how far had you got with your lecture des hermies i finished the rapid expose of satanism but i haven't yet spoken of the genuine monster the only real master that exists at the present time that defrocked abbe oh exclaimed carre take care the mere name of that man brings disaster bah canon d'ocre to utter his ineffable name can do nothing to us i confess i cannot understand why he should inspire any terror but never mind i should like for durtal before we hunt up the cannon to see your friend gévingy who seems to be best and most intimately acquainted with him a conversation with gévingy would considerably amplify my contributions to the study of satanism especially as regards benefices and succubacy let's see would you mind if we invited him here to dine carre scratched his head then emptied the ashes of his pipe on his thumbnail well you see the fact is we have had a slight disagreement what about oh nothing very serious i interrupted his experiments here one day but pour yourself some liqueur monsieur durtal and you des hermies why you aren't drinking at all and while lighting their cigarettes both sipped a few drops of almost proof cognac carre resumed 
gévingy who though an astrologer is a good christian and an honest man whom indeed i should be glad to see again wished to consult my bells that surprises you but it's so bells formerly played quite an important part in the forbidden science the art of predicting the future with their sounds is one of the least known and most disused branches of the occult gévingy had dug up some documents and wished to verify them in the tower why what did he do how do i know he stood under the bell at the risk of breaking his bones a man of his age on the scaffolding there he was halfway into the bell the bell like a great hat you see coming clear down over his hips and he soliloquized aloud and listened to the repercussions of his voice making the bronze vibrate he spoke to me also of the interpretation of dreams about bells according to him whoever in his sleep sees bells swinging is menaced by an accident if the bell chimes it is presage of slander if it falls a taxia is certain if it breaks it is assurance of afflictions and miseries finally he added i believe that if the night birds fly around a bell by moonlight one may be sure that sacrilegious robbery will be committed in the church or that the curate's life is in danger be all that as it may this business of touching the bells getting up into them and you know they're consecrated of attributing to them the gift of prophecy of involving them in the interpretation of dream an art formerly forbidden in leviticus displeased me and i demanded somewhat rudely that he desist but you did not quarrel no and i confess i regret having been so hasty well then i will arrange it i shall go see him agreed said des hermies by all means with that we must run along and give you a chance to get to bed seeing that you have to be up at dawn oh at half past five for the six o'clock angelus and then if i want to i can go back to bed for i don't have to ring again till a quarter to eight and then all i have to do is sound a couple of times for the curate's mass as you can see i have a pretty easy thing of it hmm exclaimed durtal if i had to get up so early it's all a matter of habit but before you go won't you have another little drink no really well good night he lighted his lantern and in single file shivering they descended the glacial pitch dark winding stair end of chapter five chapter six of la bas by jory karl heismans translated by keen wallace this librivox recording is in the public domain next morning durtal woke later than usual before he opened his eyes there was a sudden flash of light in his brain and troops of demon worshippers like the societies of which des hermies had spoken went defiling past him dancing a saraband a swarm of lady acrobats hanging head downward from trapezes and praying with joined feet he said yawning he looked at the window the panes were flowered with crystal fleur-de-lis and frost ferns then he quickly drew his arms back under the covers and snuggled up luxuriously a fine day to stay at home and work he said i will get up and light a fire come now a little courage and instead of tossing the covers aside he drew them up around his chin ah i know that you are not pleased to see me taking a morning off he said addressing his cat which was hunched up on the counterpane at his feet gazing at him fixedly its eyes very black this beast though affectionate and fond of being caressed was crabbed and set in its ways it would tolerate no whims no departures from the regular course of things it understood that there was a fixed hour for rising and for going to bed and when it was displeased it allowed a shade of annoyance to pass into its eyes the sense of which its master could not mistake if he returned before eleven at night the cat was waiting for him in the vestibule scratching the wood of the door meowing even before durtal was in the hall then it rolled its languorous green golden eyes at him rubbed against his trouser leg stood up on its hind feet like a tiny rearing horse and affectionately wagged its head at him as he approached if eleven o'clock had passed it did not run along in front of him but would only very grudgingly rise when he came up and then it would arch its back and suffer no caresses when he came later yet it would not budge and would complain and groan if he took the liberty of stroking its head or scratching its throat this morning it had no patience with durtal's laziness it squatted on its hunkers and swelled up 
then it approached stealthily and sat down two steps away from its master's face staring at him with an atrociously false eye signifying that the time had come for him to abdicate and leave the warm place for a cold cat amused by its manoeuvres durtal did not move but returned its stare the cat was enormous common and yet bizarre with its rusty coat yellowish like old coke ashes and grey as the fuzz on a new broom with little white tufts like the fleece which flies up from the burnt-out faggot it was a genuine gutter cat long-legged with a wild beast head it was regularly striped with waving lines of ebony its paws were encircled by black bracelets and its eyes lengthened by two great zigzags of ink in spite of your killjoy character and your single-track mind you testy old bachelor you are a very nice cat said durtal in an insinuating wheedling tone then too for many years now i have told you what one tells no man you are the drain-pipe of my soul you inattentive and indulgent confessor never shocked you vaguely approve the mental misdeeds which i confess to you you let me relieve myself and you don't charge me anything for the service frankly that is what you are here for i spoil you with care and attentions because you are the spiritual vent of solitude and celibacy but that doesn't prevent you with your spiteful way of looking at me from being insufferable at times as you are to-day for instance the cat continued to stare at him its ears sticking straight up as if they would catch the sense of his words from the inflections of his voice it understood doubtless that durtal was not disposed to jump out of bed for it went back to its old place but now turned its back full on him oh come said durtal discouraged looking at his watch i've simply got to get up and go to work on gilles de Ray and with a bound he sprang into his trousers the cat rising suddenly galloped across the counterpane and rolled itself up into the warm covers without waiting an instant longer how cold it is and durtal slipped on a knit jacket and went into the other room to start a fire i shall freeze he murmured fortunately his apartment was easy to heat it consisted simply of a hall a tiny sitting-room a minute bedroom and a large enough bathroom it was on the fifth floor facing a sufficiently airy court rent eight hundred francs it was furnished without luxury the little sitting-room durtal had converted into a study hiding the walls behind black wood bookcases crammed with books in front of the window were a great table a leather armchair and a few straight chairs he had removed the glass from the mantelpiece and in the panel just over the mantel-shelf which was covered with an old fabric he had nailed an antique painting on wood representing a hermit kneeling beside a cardinal's hat and purple cloak beneath a hut of boughs the colours of the landscape background had faded the blues to grey the whites to russet the greens to black and time had darkened the shadows to a burnt onion hue along the edges of the picture almost against the black oak frame a continuous narrative unfolded in unintelligible episodes intruding one upon the other portraying lilliputian figures in houses of dwarfs here the saint whose name durtal had sought in vain crossed a curly wooden sea in a sailboat there he marched through a village as big as a fingernail then he disappeared into the shadows of the painting and was discovered higher up in a grotto in the orient surrounded by dromedaries and bales of merchandise again he was lost from sight and after another game of hide-and-seek he emerged smaller than ever quite alone with a staff in his hand and a knapsack on his back mounting toward a strange unfinished cathedral it was a picture by an unknown painter an old dutchman who had perhaps visited certain of the italian masters for he had appropriated colours and processes peculiar to them the bedroom contained a big bed a chest of drawers waist high and some easy chairs on the mantel were an antique clock and copper candlesticks on the wall there was a fine photograph of a botticelli in the berlin museum representing a plump and penitent virgin who was like a housewife in tears she was surrounded by gentlemen lady and little boy angels the languishing young men held spliced wax tapers that were like bits of rope the coquettish hoydens had flowers stuck in their long hair and the mischievous cherub pages looked rapturously at the infant jesus who stood beside the virgin and held out his hands in benediction then there was a print of bruegel engraved by cock the wise and the foolish virgins 
a little panel cut in the middle by a corkscrew cloud which was flanked at each side by angels with their sleeves rolled up and their cheeks puffed out sounding the trumpet while in the middle of the cloud another angel bizarre and sacerdotal with his navel indicated beneath his languorously flowing robe unrolled a banderole on which was written the verse of the gospel ecce sponsus venit exite obvia mei beneath the cloud at one side sat the wise virgins good flemings with their lighted lamps and sang canticles as they turned the spinning wheel at the other side were the foolish virgins with their empty lamps four joyous gossips were holding hands and dancing in a ring on the greensward while the fifth played the bagpipe and beat time with her foot above the cloud the five wise virgins slender and ethereal now naked and charming brandished flaming tapers and mounted toward a gothic church where christ stood to welcome them while on the other side the foolish virgins imperfectly draped beat vainly on a closed door with their dead torches the blessed naivete of the primitives the homely touches in the scenes of earth and of heaven durtal loved this old engraving he saw in it a union of the art of an ostade purified and that of a thierry bou waiting for his grate in which the charcoal was crackling and peeling and running like frying grease to become red he sat down in front of his desk and ran over his notes let's see he said to himself rolling a cigarette we had come to the time when that excellent gilles de Rey begins the quest of the great work it is easy to figure what knowledge he possessed about the method of transmuting metals into gold alchemy was already highly developed a century before he was born the writings of albertus magnus arnaud de villeneuve and raymond lully were in the hands of the hermetics the manuscripts of nicolas flamel circulated and there is no doubt that gilles had acquired them for he was an avid collector of the rare let us add that at the epoch the edict of charles interdicting spagyric labours under pain of prison and hanging and the bull spondent pariter quas non exhibent which pope john the twenty second fulminated against the alchemists were still in vigour these treatises were then forbidden and in consequence desirable it is certain that gilles had long studied them but from that to understanding them is a far cry for they were written in an impossible jargon of allegories twisted and obscure metaphors incoherent symbols ambiguous parables enigmas and ciphers and here is an example he took from one of the shelves of the library a manuscript which was none other than the ash mesareff the book of the jew abraham and of nicolas flamel restored translated and annotated by eliphas levy this manuscript had been lent him by des hermies who had discovered it one day among some old papers in this is what claims to be the recipe for the philosopher's stone for the grand quintessential and tinctural essence the figures are not precisely clear he said to himself as he ran his eye over the pen drawings retouched in colour representing under the title of the chemical coitus various bottles and flasks each containing a liquid and imprisoning an allegorical creature a green lion with a crescent moon over him hung head downward doves were trying to fly out through the neck of the bottle or to peck a way through the bottom the liquid was black and undulated with waves of carmine and gold or white and granulated with dots of ink which sometimes took the shape of a frog or a star sometimes the liquid was milky and troubled sometimes flames rose from it as if there were a film of alcohol over the surface eliphas levy explained the symbolism of these bottled volatiles as fully as he cared to but abstained from giving the famous recipe for the grand magisterium he was keeping up the pleasantry of his other books in which beginning with an air of solemnity he affirmed his intention of unveiling the old arcana and when the time came to fulfil his promise begged the question alleging the excuse that he would perish if he betrayed such burning secrets the same excuse which had done duty through the ages served in masking the perfect ignorance of the cheap occultists of the present day as a matter of fact the great work is simple said durtal to himself folding up the manuscript of nicolas flamel the hermetic philosophers discovered and modern science after long evading the issue no longer denies that the metals are compounds and that their components are identical they vary from each other according to the different proportions of their elements with the aid of an agent which will displace these proportions one may transmute mercury for example into silver and lead into gold and this agent is the philosopher's stone 
mercury not the vulgar mercury which to the alchemists was but an aborted metallic sperm but the philosopher's mercury called also the green lion the serpent the milk of the virgin the pontic water only the recipe for this mercury or stone of the sages has ever been revealed and it is this that the philosophers of the middle ages the renaissance all centuries including our own have sought so frantically and in what has it not been sought said durtal thumbing his notes in arsenic in ordinary mercury tin salts of vitriol saltpetre and nitre in the juices of spurge poppy and purslane in the bellies of starved toads in human urine in the menstrual fluid and the milk of women now gilles de ray must have been completely baffled alone at tiffauges without the aid of initiates he was incapable of making fruitful experiments at that time paris was the centre of the hermetic science in france the alchemists gathered under the vaults of notre dame and studied the hieroglyphics which nicolas flamel before he died had written on the walls of the charnal des innocents and on the portal of saint jacques de la boucherie describing cabalistically the preparation of the famous stone the marshal could not go to paris because the english soldiers barred the roads there was only one thing to do he wrote to the most celebrated of the southern transmuters and had them brought to tiffauges at great expense from documents which we possess we can see his supervising the construction of the athanor or alchemist's furnace buying pelicans crucibles and retorts he turned one of the wings of his chateau into a laboratory and shut himself up in it with antonio di palermo francois lombard and jean petit goldsmith of paris all of whom busied themselves night and day with the concoction of the great work they were completely unsuccessful at the end of their resources these hermetists disappeared and there ensued at tiffauges an incredible coming and going of adepts and their helpers they arrived from all parts of brittany poitou and maine alone or escorted by promoters and sorcerers gilles de sillier and roger de briqueville cousins and friends of the marshal scurried about the country beating up the game and driving it into gilles de ray while a priest of his chapel eustache blanchier went to italy where workers in metals were legion while waiting gilles de ray not to be discouraged continued his experiments all of which missed fire he finally came to believe that the magicians were right after all and that no discovery was possible without the aid of satan and one night with a sorcerer newly arrived from poitiers jean de la riviere he betakes himself to a forest in the vicinity of the chateau de tiffauges with his servitors henriet and poitou he remains on the verge of the wood into which the sorcerer penetrates the night is heavy and there is no moon gilles becomes nervous scrutinizing the shadows listening to the muted sounds of the nocturnal landscape his companions terrified huddle close together trembling and whispering at the slightest stirring of the air suddenly a cry of anguish is raised they hesitate then they advance groping in the darkness in a sudden flare of light they perceive de la riviere trembling and deathly pale clutching the handle of his lantern convulsively in a low voice he recounts how the devil has risen in the form of a leopard and rushed past without looking at the evocator without saying a word the next day the sorcerer vanished but another arrived this was a bungler named dumenil he required gilles to sign with blood a deed binding him to give the devil all the devil asked of him except his life and soul but although to aid the conjurements gilles consented to have the office of the damned sung in his chapel on all saints day satan did not appear the marshal was beginning to doubt the powers of his magicians when the outcome of a new endeavour convinced him that frequently the devil does appear an evocator whose name has been lost held a seance with gilles and de sillier in a chamber at tiffauges on the ground he traces a great circle and commands his two companions to step inside it sillier refuses gripped by a terror which he cannot explain he begins to tremble all over he goes to the window opens it and stands ready for flight murmuring exorcisms under his breath gilles bolder stands in the middle of the circle but at the first conjugations he too trembles and tries to make the sign of the cross the sorcerer orders him not to budge at one moment he feels something seize him by the neck panic-stricken he vacillates supplicating our lady to save him the evocator furious throws him out of the circle 
gilles precipitates himself through the door de sillier jumps out of the window they meet below and stand aghast howls are heard in the chamber where the magician is operating there is a sound as of sword strokes raining on a wooden billet then groans cries of distress the appeals of a man being assassinated they stand rooted to the spot when the clamour ceases they venture to open the door and find the sorcerer lying in pools of blood his forehead caved in his body horribly mangled they carry him out gilles smitten with remorse gives the man his own bed bandages him and has him confessed for several days the sorcerer hovers between life and death but finally recovers and flees from the castle gilles was despairing of obtaining from the devil the recipe for the sovereign magisterium when eustache blanchet's return from italy was announced eustache brought the master of florentine magic the irresistible evoker of demons and larvae francesco prelati this man struck awe into gilles barely twenty-three years old he was one of the wittiest the most erudite and the most polished men of the time what had he done before he came to install himself at Tifoge, there to begin with gilles the most frightful series of sins against the holy ghost that has ever been known his testimony in the criminal trial of gilles does not furnish us any very detailed information on his own score he was born in the diocese of lucca at pistoia and had been ordained a priest by the bishop of arezzo some time after his entrance into the priesthood he had become the pupil of a thaumaturge of florence jean de fontenelle and had signed a pact with a demon named baron from that moment onward this insinuating and persuasive learned and charming abbe must have given himself over to the most abominable of sacrileges and the most murderous practices of black magic at any rate gilles came completely under the influence of this man the extinguished furnaces were relighted and that stone of the sages which prelati had seen flexible frail red and smelling of calcinated marine salt they sought together furiously invoking hell their incantations were all in vain gilles disconsolate redoubled them but they finally produced a dreadful result and prelati narrowly escaped with his life one afternoon eustache blanchet in a gallery of the chateau perceives the marshal weeping bitterly plaints of supplication are heard through the door of a chamber in which prelati has been evoking the devil the demon is in there beating my poor francis i implore you go in cries gilles but blanchet frightened refuses then gilles makes up his mind in spite of his fear he is advancing to force the door when it opens and prelati staggers out and falls bleeding into his arms prelati is able with the support of his friends to gain the chamber of the marshal where he is put to bed but he has sustained so merciless a thrashing that he goes into delirium and his fever keeps mounting gilles in despair stays beside him cares for him has him confessed and weeps for joy when prelati is out of danger the fate of the unknown sorcerer and of prelati both getting dangerously wounded in an empty room under identical circumstances i tell you it's a remarkable coincidence said durtal to himself and the documents which relate these facts are authentic they are indeed excerpts from the procedure in gilles trial the confessions of the accused and the depositions of the witnesses agree and it is impossible to think that gilles and prelati lied for in confessing these satanic evocations they condemned themselves by their own words to be burned alive if in addition they had declared that the evil one had appeared to them that they had been visited by succubi if they had affirmed that they heard voices smelled odours even touched a body we might conclude that they had had hallucinations similar to those of certain bicetre subjects but as it was there could have been no misfunctioning of the senses no morbid visions because the wounds the marks of the blows the material fact visible and tangible are present for testimony imagine how thoroughly convinced of the reality of the devil a mystic like gilles de Rey must have been after witnessing such scenes in spite of his discomfitures he could not doubt and prelati half killed must have doubted even less that if satan pleased they should finally find this powder which would load them with riches and even render them almost immortal for at that epoch the philosopher's stone passed not only for an agent in the transmutation of base metals such as tin lead copper into noble metals like silver and gold but also for a panacea curing all ailments and prolonging life without infirmities beyond the limits formerly assigned to the patriarchs 
singular science ruminated durtal raising the fender of his fireplace and warming his feet in spite of the railleries of this time which in the matter of discoveries but exhumes lost things the hermetic philosophy was not wholly vain the master of contemporary science dumas recognizes under the name of isomery the theories of the alchemists and berthelot declares no one can affirm a priori that the fabrication of bodies reputed to be simple is impossible then there have been verified and certified achievements besides nicolas flamel who really seems to have succeeded in the great work the chemist van helmont in the eighteenth century received from an unknown man a quarter of a grain of philosopher's stone and with it transformed eight ounces of mercury into gold at the same epoch helvetius who combated the dogma of the spagyrics received from another unknown a powder of projection with which he converted an ingot of lead into gold helvetius was not precisely a charlatan neither was spinoza who verified the experiment a credulous simpleton and what is to be thought of that mysterious man alexander seton who under the name of the cosmopolite went all over europe operating before princes in public transforming all metals into gold this alchemist who seems to have had a sincere disdain for riches as he never kept the gold which he created but lived in poverty and prayer was imprisoned by christian the second elector of saxony and endured martyrdom like a saint he suffered himself to be beaten with rods and pierced with pointed stakes and he refused to give up a secret which he claimed like nicolas flamel to have received from god and to think that these researches are being carried on at the present time only most of the hermetics now deny medical and divine virtues to the famous stone they think simply that the grand magisterium is a ferment which thrown into metals in fusion produces a molecular transformation similar to that which organic matter undergoes when fermented with the aid of eleven de hermie who is well acquainted with the underworld of science maintains that more than forty alchemic furnaces are now alight in france and that in hanover and bavaria the adepts are more numerous yet have they rediscovered the incomparable secret of antiquity in spite of certain affirmations it is hardly probable nobody need manufacture artificially a metal whose origins are so unaccountable that a deposit is likely to be found anywhere for instance in a lawsuit which took place at paris in the month of november eighteen eighty six between monsieur pop constructor of pneumatic city clocks and financiers who had been backing him certain engineers and chemists of the school of mines declared that gold could be extracted from common silex so that the very walls sheltering us might be places and the mansards might be loaded with nuggets at any rate he continued smiling these sciences are not propitious he was thinking of an old man who had installed an alchemic laboratory on the fifth floor of a house in the rue saint jacques this man named auguste redouté went every afternoon to the bibliothèque nationale and pored over the works of nicolas flamel morning and evening he pursued the quest of the great work in front of his furnace the sixteenth of march the year before he came out of the bibliothèque with a man who had been sitting at the same table with him and as they walked along together redouté declared that he was finally in possession of the famous secret arriving in his laboratory he threw pieces of iron into a retort made a projection and obtained crystals the colour of blood the other examined the salts and made a flippant remark the alchemist furious threw himself upon him struck him with a hammer and had to be overpowered and carried in a straitjacket to saint anne pending investigation in the sixteenth century in luxembourg initiates were roasted in iron cages the following century in germany they were clothed in rags and hanged on gilded gibbets now that they are tolerated and left in peace they go mad decidedly fate is against them durtal concluded he rose and went to answer a ring at the door he came back with a letter which the concierge had brought he opened it why what is this he exclaimed his astonishment grew as he read monsieur i am neither an adventuress nor a seeker of adventures nor am i a society woman grown weary of drawing-room conversation even less am i moved by the vulgar curiosity to find out whether an author is the same in the flesh as he is in his books indeed i am none of the things which you may think i am from my writing to you this way the fact is that i have just finished reading your last book she has taken her time murmured durtal it appeared a year ago melancholy as an imprisoned soul vainly beating its wings against the bars of its cage 
oh hell what a compliment anyway it rings false like all of them and now monsieur though i am convinced that it is always folly and madness to try to realize a desire will you permit that a sister in lassitude meet you some evening in a place which you shall designate after which we shall return each of us into our own interior the interior of persons destined to fall because they are out of line with their fellows adieu monsieur be assured that i consider you as somebody in a century of nobodies not knowing whether this note will elicit a reply i abstain from making myself known this evening a maid will call upon your concierge and ask him if there is a letter for madame maubel hmm said durtal folding up the letter i know her she must be one of these withered dames who are always trying to cash outlawed kiss tickets and soul warrants in the lottery of love forty-five years old at least her clientele is composed of boys who are always satisfied if they don't have to pay and men of letters who are yet more easily satisfied for the ugliness of authors as mistresses is proverbial unless this is simply a practical joke but who would be playing one on me i don't know anybody and why in any case he would simply not reply but in spite of himself he reopened the letter well now what do i risk if this woman wants to sell me an overripe heart there is nothing forcing me to purchase it i don't commit myself to anything by going to an assignation but where shall i meet her here no once she gets into my apartment complications arise for it is much more difficult to throw a woman out of your house than simply to walk off and leave her at a street corner suppose i designated the corner of the rue de sèvres and the rue de la chaise under the wall of the abbe au bois it is solitary and then too it is only a minute's walk from here or oh, no i will begin vaguely naming no meeting place at all i shall solve that problem later when i get her reply he wrote a letter in which he spoke of his own spiritual lassitude and declared that no good could come of an interview for he no longer sought happiness on earth i will add that i am in poor health that is always a good one and it excuses a man from being a man if necessary he said to himself rolling a cigarette well that's done and she won't get much encouragement out of it oh wait i omitted something to keep from giving her a hold on me i shall do well to let her know that a serious and sustained liaison with me is impossible for family reasons and that's enough for one time he folded the letter and scrawled the address then he held the sealed envelope in his hand and reflected of course i am a fool to answer her who knows what situations a thing like this is going to lead to i am well aware that whoever she be a woman is an incubator of sorrow and annoyance if she is good she is probably stupid or perhaps she is an invalid or perhaps she is so disastrously fecund that she gets pregnant if you look at her if she is bad one may expect to be dragged through every disgusting kind of degradation oh, whatever you do you're in for it he regurgitated the memories of his youthful amours deception disenchantment how pitilessly base a woman is while she is young to be thinking of things like that now at my age as if i had any need of a woman now but in spite of it all his pseudonymous correspondent interested him who knows perhaps she is good-looking or at least not very ill-looking it doesn't cost me anything to find out he re-read her letter no misspelling the handwriting not commercial her ideas about his book were mediocre enough but who would expect her to be a critic discreet scent of heliotrope he added sniffing the envelope oh well let's have our little fling and as he went out to get some breakfast he left his reply with the concierge end of chapter six chapter seven of la ba by jory karl heismans translated by keen wallace this librivox recording is in the public domain if this continues i shall lose my mind murmured durtal as he sat in front of his table reperusing the letters which he had been receiving from that woman for the last week she was an indefatigable letter writer and since she had begun her advances he had not had time to answer one letter before another arrived my he said 
let's try and see just where we do stand after that ungracious answer to her first note she immediately sends me this monsieur this is a farewell if i were weak enough to write you any more letters they would become as tedious as the life i lead anyway have i not had the best part of you in that hesitant letter of yours which shook me out of my lethargy for an instant like yourself monsieur i know alas that nothing happens and that our only certain joys are those we dream of so in spite of my feverish desire to know you i fear that you were right in saying that a meeting would be for both of us the source of regrets to which we ought not voluntarily expose ourselves then what bears witness to the perfect futility of this exordium is the way the missive ends if you should take the fancy to write me you can safely address your letters madame maubel rue Littré, general delivery i shall be passing the rue Littré post office monday if you wish to let matters remain just where they are and thus cause me a great deal of pain will you not tell me so frankly whereupon i was simple-minded enough to compose an epistle as ambiguous as the first concealing my furtive advances under an apparent reluctance thus letting her know that i was securely hooked as her third note proves never accuse yourself monsieur i repress a tenderer name which rises to my lips of being unable to give me consolation weary disabused as we are and done with it all let us sometimes permit our souls to speak to each other low very low as i have spoken to you this night for henceforth my thought is going to follow you wherever you are four pages of the same tune he said turning the leaves but this is better to-night my unknown friend one word only i have passed a horrible day my nerves in revolt and crying out against the petty sufferings they are subjected to every minute a slamming door a harsh or squeaky voice floating up to me out of the street yet there are whole hours when i am so far from being sensitive that if the house were burning i should not move am i about to send you a page of comic lamentations ah when one has not the gift of rendering one's grief superbly and transforming it into literary or musical passages which weep magnificently the best thing is to keep still about it i bid you a silent good night as on the first day i am harassed by the conflict of the desire to see you and the dread of touching a dream lest it perish ah yes you spoke truly miserable miserable wretches that we are our timorous souls are so afraid of any reality that they dare not think a sympathy which has taken possession of them capable of surviving an interview with the person who gave it birth yet in spite of this fine casuistry i simply must confess to you no no nothing guess if you can and forgive me for this banal letter or rather read between the lines and perhaps you will find there a little bit of my heart and a great deal of what i leave unsaid a foolish letter with i written all over it who would suspect that while i wrote it my sole thought was of you so far so good this woman at least piqued my curiosity and what peculiar ink he thought it was myrtle green very thin very pale with his fingernail he detached some of the fine dust of rice powder perfumed with heliotrope clinging to the seal of the letters she must be blonde he went on examining the tint of the powder for it isn't the rachel shade that brunettes use now up to that point everything had been going nicely but then and there i spoiled it moved by i know not what folly i wrote her a yet more roundabout letter which however was very pressing in attempting to fan her flame i kindled myself for a spectre and at once i received this what shall i do i neither wish to see you nor can i consent to annihilate my overwhelming desire to meet you last night in spite of me your name which was burning me sprang from my lips my husband one of your admirers it seems appeared to be somewhat humiliated by the preoccupation which indeed was absorbing me and causing unbearable shivers to run all through me a common friend of yours and mine for why should i not tell you that you know me if to have met socially is to know any one one of your friends then came up and said that frankly he was very much taken with you 
i was in a state of such utter lack of self-control that i don't know what i should have done had it not been for the unwitting assistance which somebody gave me by pronouncing the name of a grotesque person of whom i can never think without laughing adieu you are right i tell myself that i will never write you again and i go and do it anyway your own as i cannot be in reality without wounding us both then when i wrote a burning reply this was brought by a maid on a dead run ah if i were not afraid afraid and you know you are just as much afraid as i am how i should fly to you no you cannot hear the thousand conversations with which my soul fatigues yours oh in my miserable existence there are hours when madness seizes me judge for yourself the whole night i spent appealing to you furiously i wept with exasperation this morning my husband came into the room my eyes were bloodshot i began to laugh crazily and when i could speak i said to him what would you think of a person who questioned as to his profession replied i am a chamber succubus ah my dear you are ill said he worse than you think said i but if i come to see you what could we talk about in the state you yourself are in your letter has completely unbalanced me you arraign your malady with a certain brutality which makes my body rejoice but alienates my soul a little ah what if our dreams could really come true ah say a word just one word from out your own heart don't be afraid that even one of your letters can possibly fall into other hands than mine so 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 this is getting to be no laughing matter concluded durtal folding up the letter the woman is married to a man who knows me it seems what a situation let's see now whom have i ever visited he tried vainly to remember no woman he had ever met at an evening party would address such declarations to him and that common friend but i have no friends except des hermies i'd better try and find out whom he has been seeing recently but as a physician he meets scores of people and then how can i explain to him tell him the story he will burst into a roar and disillusion me before i have got halfway through the narrative and durtal became irritated for within him a really incomprehensible phenomenon was taking place he was burning for this unknown woman he was positively obsessed by her he who had renounced all carnal relations years ago who when the barns of his senses were opened contented himself with driving the disgusting herd of sin to the commercial shambles to be summarily knocked in the head by the butcher girls of love he he was getting himself to believe in the teeth of all experience in the teeth of good judgment that with a woman as passionate as this one seemed to be he would experience superhuman sensations and novel abandon and he imagined her as he would have her blonde firm of flesh lithe feline melancholy capable of frenzies and the picture of her brought on such a tension of nerves that his teeth rattled for a week in the solitude in which he lived he had dreamed of her and had become thoroughly aroused and incapable of doing any work even of reading for the image of this woman interposed itself between him and the page he tried suggesting to himself ignoble visions he would imagine this creature in moments of corporal distress and thus calm his desires with unappetizing hallucinations but the procedure which had formerly been very effective when he desired a woman and could not have her now failed utterly he somehow could not imagine his unknown in quest of bismuth or of linen he could not see her otherwise than rebellious melancholy dizzy with desire kindling him with her eyes inflaming him with her pale hands and his sensual resurrection was incredible an aberrated dog-star flaming in a physical november at a spiritual all hallows tranquil dried up safe from crises without veritable desires almost impotent or rather completely forgetful of sex for months at a time he was suddenly roused and for an unreality by the mystery of mad letters enough he cried smiting the table a jarring blow he clapped on his hat and went out slamming the door behind him i know how to make my imagination behave and he rushed over to the latin quarter to see a prostitute he knew i have been a good boy too long he murmured as he hurried down the street one can't stay on the straight and narrow path for ever he found the woman at home and had a miserable time she was a buxom brunette with festive eyes and the teeth of a wolf an expert she could in a few seconds drain one's marrow granulate the lungs and demolish the loins 
she chid him for having been away so long then cajoled him and kissed him he felt pathetic listless out of breath out of place for he had no genuine desires he finally flung himself on a couch and enervated to the point of crying he went through the back-breaking motions mechanically like a dredge never had he so execrated the flesh never had he felt such repugnance and lassitude as when he issued from that room he strolled haphazard down the rue soufflot and the image of the unknown obsessed him more irritating more tenacious i begin to understand the superstition of the succubus i must try some bromo exorcism tonight i will swallow a gram of bromide of potassium that will make my senses be good but he realized that the trouble was not primarily physical that really it was only the consequence of an extraordinary state of mind his love for that which departed from the formula for that projection out of the world which had recently cheered him in art had deviated and sought expression in a woman she embodied his need to soar upward from the terrestrial humdrum it is those precious unworldly studies those cloister thoughts picturing ecclesiastical and demoniac scenes which have prepared me for the present folly he said to himself his unsuspected and hitherto unexpressed mysticism which had determined his choice of subject for his last work was now sending him out in disorder to seek new pains and pleasures as he walked along he recapitulated what he knew of the woman she was married blonde in easy circumstances because she had her own sleeping quarters and a maid she lived in the neighbourhood because she went to the rue Littré post office for her mail her name supposing she had prefixed her own initial to the name of maubel was henriette hortense honorine hubertine or Hélène. what else she must frequent the society of artists because she had met him and for years he had not been in a bourgeois drawing-room she was some kind of a morbid catholic because that word succubus was unknown to the profane that was all then there was her husband who gullible as he might be must nevertheless suspect their liaison since by her own confession she dissembled her obsession very badly this is what i get for letting myself be carried away for i too wrote at first to amuse myself with aphrodisiac statements then i ended by becoming completely hysterical we have taken turns fanning smouldering ashes which now are blazing it is too bad that we have both become inflamed at the same time for her case must be the same as mine to judge from the passionate letters she writes what shall i do keep on tantalizing myself for a chimera no i'll bring matters to a head see her and if she is good-looking sleep with her i shall have peace anyway he looked about him without knowing how he had got there he found himself in the jardin des plantes he oriented himself remembering that there was a cafe on the side facing the quay and went to find it he tried to control himself and write a letter at once ardent and firm but the pen shook in his fingers he wrote at a gallop confessed that he regretted not having consented at the outset to the meeting she proposed and attempting to check himself declared we must see each other think of the harm we are doing ourselves teasing each other at a distance think of the remedy we have at hand my poor darling i implore you he must indicate a place of meeting he hesitated let me think he said to himself i don't want her to alight at my place too dangerous then the best thing to do would be to offer her a glass of port and a biscuit and conduct her to la Venuse, which is a hotel as well as a cafe i will reserve a room that will be less disgusting than an assignation house very well then let us put in place of the rue de la chaise the waiting-room of the gare montparnasse sometimes it is quite empty well that's done he gummed the envelope and felt a kind of relief ah i was forgetting garçon the botin de paris he searched for the name maubel thinking that by some chance it might be her own of course it was hardly probable but she seemed so imprudent that with her anything was to be expected he might very easily have met a madame maubel and forgotten her he found a maubé and a maubec but no maubel of course that proves nothing he said closing the directory he went out and threw his letter into the box the joker in this is the husband but hell i am not likely to take his wife away from him very long he had an idea of going home but he realized that he would do no work that alone he would relapse into daydream if i went up to des hermies place 
yes today was his consultation day it's an idea he quickened his pace came to the rue madame and rang at an entresol the housekeeper opened the door ah monsieur durtal he is out but he will be in soon will you wait but you are sure he is coming back why yes he ought to be here now she said stirring the fire as soon as she had retired durtal sat down then becoming bored he went over and began browsing among the books which covered the wall as in his own place de hermy certainly has some curious items he murmured opening a very old book here's a treatise written centuries ago to suit my case exactly manuale exorcismorum well i'll be damned it's a plantain and what does this manual have to recommend in the treatment of the possessed hmm contains some quaint counter spells here are some for energumens for the bewitched here are some against love filters and against the plague against spells cast on comestibles some even to keep butter and milk sweet that isn't odd the devil entered into everything in the good old days and what can this be in his hand he held two little volumes with crimson edges bound in fawn-coloured calf he opened them and looked at the title the anatomy of the mass by pierre du moulin dated geneva sixteen twenty four might prove interesting he went to warm his feet and hastily skimmed through one of the volumes why he said it's mighty good on the page which he was reading was a discussion of the priesthood the author affirmed that none might exercise the functions of the priesthood if he was not sound in body or if any of his members had been amputated and asking apropos of this if a castrated man could be ordained a priest he answered his own question no unless he carries upon him reduced to powder the parts which are wanting he added however that cardinal tollet did not admit this interpretation which nevertheless had been universally adopted durtal amused read on now du moulin was debating with himself the point whether it was necessary to interdict abbés ravaged by lechery and in answer he cited himself the melancholy glows of canon maximianus who in his distinction eighty one sighs it is commonly said that none ought to be deposed from his charge for fornication in view of the fact that few can be found exempt from this vice why you here said des hermies entering what are you reading the anatomy of the mass oh it's a poor thing for protestants i am just about distracted oh my friend what brutes those people are and like a man with a great weight on his chest he unburdened himself yes i have just come from a consultation with those whom the journals characterize as princes of science for a quarter of an hour i have had to listen to the most contradictory opinions on one point however all agreed that my patient was a dead man finally they compromised and decided that the poor wretch's torture should be needlessly prolonged by a course of moxas i timidly remarked that it would be simpler to send for a confessor and then assuage the sufferings of the dying man with repeated injections of morphine if you had seen their faces they came as near as anything to denouncing me as a tout for the priests and such is contemporary science everybody discovers a new or forgotten disease and trumpets a forgotten or a new remedy and nobody knows a thing and then too what good does it do one not to be hopelessly ignorant since there is so much sophistication going on in pharmacy that no physician can be sure of having his prescriptions filled to the letter one example among many at present syrup of white poppy the diacodia of the old codex does not exist it is manufactured with laudanum and syrup of sugar as if they were the same thing we have got so we no longer dose substances but prescribe ready-made remedies and use those surprising specifics which fill up the fourth pages of the journals it's a compromise medicine a democratic medicine one cure for all cases it's scandalous it's silly no there is no use in talking the old therapeutics based on experience was better than this at least it knew that remedies ingested in pill powder or bolus form were treacherous so it prescribed them only in the liquid state now too every physician specializes the oculists see only the eyes and to cure them quite calmly poison the body with their pilocarpine they have ruined the health of how many people for ever others treat cutaneous affections they drive an eczema inward on an old man who as soon as he is cured becomes childish or dangerous there is no more solidarity allegiance to one party means hostility to all others it's a mess now my honourable confrères are stumbling around taking a fancy to medicaments which they don't even know how to use 
take antipyrene for example it is one of the very few really active products that the chemists have found in a long time well where is the doctor who knows that applied in a compress with iodide and cold bon dono spring water antipyrene combats the supposedly incurable ailment cancer and if that seems incredible it is true nevertheless honestly said durtal you believe that the old-time doctors came nearer healing yes because miraculously they know the effects of certain invariable remedies prepared without fraud of course it is self-evident that when old paré eulogized sack medicine and ordered his patients to carry pulverized medicaments in a little sack whose form varied according to the organ to be healed assuming the form of a cap for the head of a bagpipe for the stomach of an ox tongue for the spleen he probably did not obtain very signal results his claim to have cured gastralgia by appositions of powder of red rose coral and mastic wormwood and mint aniseed and nutmeg is certainly not to be borne out but he also had other systems and often he cured because he possessed the science of simples which is now lost the present-day physicians shrug their shoulders when the name of ambrose pare is mentioned they used to pooh-pooh the idea of the alchemists that gold had medicinal virtue their fine scorn does not now prevent them from using alternate doses of the salts and of the filings of this metal they use concentrated arseniate of gold against anemia muriate against syphilis cyanide against amenorrhea and scrofula and chloride of sodium and gold against old ulcers no i assure you it is disgusting to be a physician for in spite of the fact that i am a doctor of science and have extensive hospital experience i am quite inferior to humble country herborists solitaries who know a great deal more than i about what is useful to know and i admit it and homeopathy it has some good things about it and some bad ones it also palliates without curing it sometimes represses maladies but for grave and acute cases it is impotent just like this matei system which however is useful as an intermediary to stave off a crisis with its blood and lymph purifying products its anti scrofuloso its angiotico its anti canceroso it sometimes modifies morbid states in which other methods are of no avail for instance it permits a patient whose kidneys have been demoralized by iodide of potassium to gain time and recuperate so that he can safely begin to drink iodide again i add that terrific shooting pains which rebel even against chloroform and morphine often yield to an application of green electricity you ask me perhaps of what ingredients this liquid electricity is made i answer that i know absolutely nothing about it Matei claims that he has been able to fix in his globules and liquors the electrical properties of certain plants, but he has never given out his recipe, hence he can tell whatever stories suit him. What is curious, anyway, is that this system, thought out by a Roman count, a Catholic, has its most important following and propaganda among Protestant pastors, whose original asininity becomes abysmal in the unbelievable homilies which accompany their essays on healing. Indeed, considered seriously, these systems are a lot of wind. The truth is that in the art of healing we grope along at hazard nevertheless with a little experience and a great deal of nerve we can manage so as not too shockingly to depopulate the cities enough of that old man and now where have you been keeping yourself it's just what i was going to ask you you haven't been to see me for over a week well just now everybody in the world is ill and i am racing around all the time by the way i've been attending chantelouve who has a pretty serious attack of gout he complains of your absence and his wife whom i should not have taken for an admirer of your books of your last novel especially speaks to me unceasingly of them and you for a person customarily so reserved she seems to me to have become quite enthusiastic about you does madame chantelouve why what's the matter he exclaimed seeing how red durtal had become oh nothing but i've got to be going good night why aren't you feeling well oh it's nothing i assure you oh well said des hermies knowing better than to insist look at this and took him into the kitchen and showed him a superb leg of mutton hanging beside the window i hung it up in a draught so as to get some of the crass freshness out of it we'll eat it when we have the astrologer gévingy to dine with us at carre's as i am the only person alive who knows how to boil a gigot à l'anglaise i am going to be the cook so i shan't come by for you you will find me in the tower disguised as a scullery maid once outside durtal took a long breath well well his unknown was chantelouve's wife impossible 
she had never paid the slightest attention to him she was silent and cold impossible and yet why had she spoken that way to des hermies but surely if she had wanted to see him she would have come to his apartment since they were acquaintances she would not have started this correspondence under a pseudonym h de maubel he said suddenly why madame chanteloup's name is hyacinthe a boy's name which suits her very well she lives in the rue babneux not very far from the rue littre post office she is a blonde she has a maid she is a fervent catholic she's the one and he experienced almost simultaneously two absolutely distinct sensations of disappointment first for his unknown pleased him better madame chanteloup would never realize the ideal he had fashioned for himself the tantalizing features the agile wild animal body the melancholy and ardent bearing which he had dreamed indeed the mere fact of knowing the unknown rendered her less desirable more vulgar accessibility killed the chimera at the same time he experienced a lively relief he might have been dealing with a hideous old crone and hyacinthe as he immediately began to call her was desirable thirty-three at most not pretty but peculiar blonde slight and supple with no hips she seemed thin because she was small-boned the face mediocre spoiled by too big a nose but the lips incandescent the teeth superb her complexion ever so faint a rose in the slightly bluish milk-white of rice water a little troubled then her real charm the really deceptive enigma of her was in her eyes ash-grey eyes which seemed uncertain myopic and which conveyed an expression of resigned boredom at certain moments the pupils glowed like a gem of grey water and sparks of silver twinkled to the surface by turns they were dolent forsaken languorous and haughty he remembered that those eyes had often brought his heart into his throat in spite of circumstantial evidence he reflected that those impassioned letters did not correspond in any way to this woman in the flesh never was woman more controlled more adept in the lies of good breeding he remembered the chanteloup at homes she seemed attentive made no contribution to the conversation played the hostess smiling without animation it was a kind of case of dual personality in one visible phase a society woman prudent and reserved in another concealed phase a wild romantic mad with passion hysterical of body nymphomaniac of soul it hardly seemed probable no he said i am on the wrong track it's merely by chance that madame chanteloup spoke of my books to des hermies and i mustn't jump to the conclusion that she is smitten with me and that she has been writing me these hot letters it isn't she but who on earth is it he continued to revolve the question without coming any nearer a solution again he called before his eyes the image of this woman and admitted that she was really potently seductive with a fresh girlish body flexible and without a lot of repugnant flesh and mysterious with her concentrated air her plaintive eyes and even her coldness real or feigned he summarized all that he really knew about her simply that she was a widow when she married chanteloup that she had no children that her first husband a manufacturer of chasubles had for unknown reasons committed suicide that was all on the other hand too too much was known about chanteloup author of a history of poland and the cabinets of the north of a history of boniface the eighth and his times a life of the blessed jean de valois founder of the annonciade a biography of the venerable mother anne de saint onge teacher of the company of saint ursula and other books of the same kind published by le coffre palmé Boussielgue, in the inevitable chagrin or sheep bindings stamped with dendriform patterns chanteloup was preparing his candidacy for the académie des inscriptions et belles lettres and hoped for the support of the party of the dukes that was why he received influential hypocrites provincial tartuffes and priests every week he doubtless had to drive himself to do this because in spite of his slinking slyness he was jovial and enjoyed a joke on the other hand he aspired to figure in the literature that counts at paris and he expended a good deal of ingenuity in veiling men of letters to his house on another evening every week to make them his aides or at least keep them from openly attacking him so soon as his candidacy an entirely clerical affair should be announced it was probably to attract and placate his adversaries that he had contrived these baroque gatherings to which out of curiosity as a matter of fact the most utterly different kinds of people came he had other motives it was said that he had no scruples about exploiting his social acquaintances 
durtal had even noticed that at each of the dinners given by chanteloube a well-dressed stranger was present and the rumour went about that this guest was a wealthy provincial to whom men of letters were exhibited like a waxwork collection and from whom before or afterward important sums were borrowed it is undeniable that the chanteloubes have no income and that they live in style catholic publishing houses and magazines pay even worse than the secular so in spite of his established reputation in the clerical world chanteloube cannot possibly maintain such a standard of living on his royalties there simply is no telling what these people are up to that this woman's home life is unhappy and that she does not love the sneaky sacristan to whom she is married is quite possible but what is her real role in that household is she accessory to chanteloube's pecuniary dodges if that is the case i don't see why she should pick on me if she is in connivance with her husband she certainly ought to have sense enough to seek an influential or wealthy lover and she is perfectly aware that i fulfil neither the one nor the other condition chantelouve knows very well that i am incapable of paying for her gowns and thus contributing to the upkeep of their establishment i make about three thousand livres and i can hardly contrive to keep myself going so that is not her game i don't know that i want to have anything to do with their kind of people he concluded somewhat chilled by these reflections but i am a big fool what i know about them proves that my unknown beloved is not chantelouve's wife and all things considered i am glad she isn't End of chapter 7